after one video of introduction and background information, then another video discussing the other gods problem, we're finally ready to begin our journey through the divided kingdom. Starting in Israel with Jeroboam, we'll work our way through all the kings of the northern kingdom, those ten tribes that seceded from the union after Solomon died. Then we'll come back to 930 BC and start all over again in Judah, going through the kings of the southern kingdom. So, in 1 Kings chapter 11, after giving us a long list of Solomon's many accomplishments, his wisdom and his wealth, the Bible tells us that Solomon amazingly turned his back on the Lord. Now, consequently, God raised up various adversaries against Solomon, one of which was identified as, quote, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and Ephraimite, unquote. His name means the people contend, and he appears at a most contentious time in Israel's history when heavy-handed government control, high taxes, and forced labor for Solomon's many building projects had caused increasing dissension and discontent. Working for King Solomon in what we'd probably call an upper-middle management position, Jeroboam supervised large numbers of workers from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. 1 Kings 11.28 says, quote, all the forced labor of the house of Joseph, unquote. So if you remember, Ephraim and Manasseh were half tribes because they were sons of Joseph. Verses 26 and 27 say he rebelled against King Solomon because, quote, Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father, unquote. <laughs> the Bible doesn't explain what a Milo is or why that was such a big deal. And I couldn't find a definitive answer on the Internet. The only picture I found looks like it might be some back steps leading into the king's palace from the temple. I don't know. Neither Kings nor Chronicles gives us a good chronology of all the events, but I'm guessing that Jeroboam rebelled sometime after he found out God had selected him to be the king of ten tribes. King Solomon found out somehow, then tried to kill him. Jeroboam fled to Egypt where he hid out until Solomon died, and then he returned to Israel where he quickly became the voice of the Tea Party. Taxed enough already. When the ten tribes split, he was a natural choice to be king, and he reigned 22 years in Shechem. Shechem? Why is that name so familiar? Shechem. Well, Shechem was 40 miles north of Jerusalem. It was situated in a mountain pass on the main north-south trade route running right through the middle of the country. If you happen to live in Wisconsin like me, you might picture La Crosse as Jerusalem. <laughs> or you might not. <laughs> but if you do, then Shechem would have to be Toma at the juncture of two interstate highways. You just can't get to La Crosse very easily from most of Wisconsin without going through Toma first. Well, it was the same way with Shechem. You just couldn't get to Jerusalem from at least m the northern part of the country very easily without first going through Shechem. But Shechem had a long and distinguished history. Remember Abraham? like a thousand years before this, Shechem was the first place he camped when he entered the Promised Land. He built an altar there and he worshipped Yahweh. Jacob's twelve sons pastured their flocks in this area. Shechem became the earliest center of worship for the twelve tribes after the Israelites entered the Promised Land. Shechem was later designated as a Levitical city of refuge in Joshua chapter 20. 
and remember that Palestinian covenant that we spent so much time talking about during the first video? Well, after they entered the promised land, Joshua gathered the nation back together again to renew that covenant. And where do you suppose they all got together? Shechem. Six tribes stood on Mount Ebal. Six tribes faced them across the valley on Mount Gerizim. Joshua and the priests stood in the valley below with the Ark of the Covenant, and they reread all the blessings they had received for obedience, all the curses they would receive for disobedience, and Joshua built an altar at Shechem. He wrote a copy of the law that they had just sworn obedience to on a pillar of stones. So Shechem became a holy place, very, very rich in spiritual significance to all Israel because that pillar would stand as a witness against them should they ever fail to keep the promises they had just reaffirmed there. Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. It was at Shechem that the people swore we will serve the Lord, not just because Yahweh was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not just because Yahweh was their parents' God, but they said, because he is our God. Well, that was Shechem around 1400 B.C. Now let's fast forward 500 years. When Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him on the road. Now Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes, but he shall have one tribe. For the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the God of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life, for the sake of David my servant whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it to you, ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. 
and I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, I will be with you, and will build you a sure house, as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you, and I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Wouldn't it be great if God gave everyone guidance this specific? He not only told Jeroboam what was going to happen, he detailed what Jeroboam had to do and how Jeroboam would benefit from doing it. This happened outside of Jerusalem, some place in the open country, it says, obviously before he took off for Egypt. And we don't know what Jeroboam's immediate response was. He probably just went back to work. Uh, I'm sure there must have been a lot more <laughs> questions, uh, and none of that is recorded in Scripture. Maybe he became anxious working for the guy whose kingdom he knew he was going to inherit someday. Maybe he whispered this to a few close friends, and maybe the whispering got around to Solomon, and maybe that's why Solomon really was trying to kill him. I'm sure he certainly rehearsed this entire encounter many times on that long road back from Egypt, on his way to Jerusalem, and the text indicates that he actually did try to negotiate a good faith settlement with Rehoboam, the new king of uh, Israel, but when talks broke down, the ten northern tribes revolted and chose Jeroboam as their king, just as God had ordained. Jeroboam then went to this historic center of Yahweh worship, Shechem, the very place where Israel had sworn their allegiance and obedience to Yahweh, and he set up his new kingdom. Yet, within three years, he instituted a worship system intentionally designed to lead people away from true Yahweh worship. Now, it's amazing that he'd do this after such a clear revelation from God, right? It's unbelievable he'd resort to using golden calves, considering how badly things turned out the last time somebody tried. But it's totally inconceivable the children of Israel would fall for the golden calf ploy again. Inconceivable! Nevertheless, that is exactly what happened. Not trusting Yahweh's personal promise and fearing for the loyalty of his own people, Jeroboam made two golden calves and established his own centers of worship at the borders of his kingdom. Dan, up in the far north near his border with Syria, and Bethel in the far south on the, that main highway leading into Jerusalem. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam did not abandon Yahweh worship. Remember when we talked about syncretism? He didn't start a brand new religion. You see that here, right? Who do these golden calves supposedly represent? Yahweh, the same God that brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam is still worshiping Yahweh, sort of. <laughs> He's just worshiping Yahweh on his own terms. This is very important. 
it's this corrupted form of Yahweh worship that eventually permeates the nation and leads Israel into the immoralities of heathenism and idol worship. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel, and went up to the altar to make offerings. This is what's left of one of Israel's high places. It was discovered uh, in the northwest corner of Dan, uh, so it could actually be one of the two set up by Jeroboam. It's an almost square platform, about 60 feet across, and it's made of large hand hewn blocks. A flight of stairs would have led up to the summit, and the whole thing would have been enclosed with an opening facing southward toward Jerusalem. Jeroboam chose the exact same spot where early Danites had erected their pagan high places centuries before. And since Baal was frequently depicted as a bull or having bull attributes, Jeroboam's compromise of representing Yahweh as a bull calf and placing it in exactly the same high place was probably designed to appeal to the broadest possible audience. For the Levites left their common lands and their holdings and came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons cast them out from serving as priests of the Lord. And he appointed his own priests for the high places and for the goat idols and for the calves that he had made. And those who had set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel came after them from all the tribes of Israel to Jerusalem. Now Jeroboam made a number of major blunders in doing so. Having a written record of what happened the last time someone built golden calves, he might have thought better of this idea. Instead, he doubled down on two golden calves. Then he built shrines in the pagan high places, knowing full well that there was only one legitimate place on earth to worship Yahweh, the temple in Jerusalem. He made up his own holiday, a convenient day of worship. And the priests were supposed to come only from among Aaron's descendants. But Jeroboam appointed his own priest from, well, anybody who wanted to be a priest. Maybe anyone who graduated divinity school. I don't know. Finally, he offered the sacrifice on the altar instead of the priest. Bad choice, Jerry. Jeroboam did all of this to keep people from going to Jerusalem but ironically, his actions literally drove away the displaced Levites who really didn't have a job now and any other devout worshiper of Yahweh. They abandoned their property and they voted with their feet. Jeroboam wanted to assure his own safety, but what he got instead was a prophet with no name. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you some of the high places who make offerings on you and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, 
dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction. Syncretism. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. But you have done evil above all who were before you, and have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger, and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free, in Israel and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. For the Lord has spoken it. There was continual warfare between Israel and Judah throughout Jeroboam's reign. The Bible mentions only one big battle, and that was at the Mount Zamarium. Now think of Zamarium as Gettysburg in my earlier comparison with the American Civil War, and just imagine Jeroboam's troops as the Confederate Army marching across those wide open Pennsylvania fields Get the picture? Despite Israel outnumbering Judah two to one, 60 percent, 60 percent of Jeroboam's forces were mowed down and he was never able to attack into southern territory again. God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The men of Israel fled before Judah and God gave them into their hand. Abijah and his people struck them with great force, so there fell slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Thus the men of Israel were subdued at that time, and the men of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord, the God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, and Jeshanah with its villages, and Ephron with its villages. Jeroboam did not recover his power in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him down, and he died. It had all started out so great, though. Jeroboam had this great promise from God of a bright future. God himself was going to give him a long dynasty even greater than King David's. But all of that ended so terribly when Jeroboam just took a turn for the worse. He abandoned the Lord for a convenient compromise that cost him most of his Levites and other Yahweh believing taxpayers as they left country and voted with their feet. <laughs> he lost most of his army in this one big battle and he assured the destruction of his own family. How sad. Instead of a long-lasting dynasty, he ended his political and military career miserably. And for the people of Israel, his reign was a supreme political and religious calamity. The humorous part of all this 
is that Jeroboam forfeited a blessed relationship with the real God of Israel in favor of two golden calves in Dan and whoops <laughs> what happened to the golden calf in Bethel well it's gone of course when Judah defeated him on Mount Zemarium they also captured the city of Bethel along with Jeroboam's golden calf <laughs> serves him right his kingdom's just getting started and they're already down one calf and with God's curse hanging over his head it sure doesn't look good for the northern team well in the fourth video we'll be finishing off Jeroboam's dynasty literally and then quickly going through the next five kings of the northern kingdom uh, none of them last very long except for Baasha you might want to read 1 Kings 15 through 16 before you start this video. Okay? Have a good day.